I think we, we lack uh, a flair for living as, as some other countries uh, have. We, we, we are very down to earth, that's true, but down to earth in a, in a particularly stolid and to me rather objectionable way. Orthodox religions, it seems to me, in our time have become the graveyards of idealism. They're, quite frankly, asking to be led, and they are being led. Are they being led by people like yourself in the advertising business? They certainly are. Because somebody said to him, Galileo, you're a traitor. What shall become of a country when it lacks great men? And Galileo says, pity the country that needs great men. Do you think the average voter is well informed? I think that the average voter is quite stupid. We're going to hear some opinions about Canada, which you may not like, and some opinions about Britain, which may surprise you. We collected these opinions from a dozen young men in the two countries, and we don't pretend that they're average opinions. We looked for young men with strong convictions, and these aren't average young men. Usually we looked for the dissenters, the rebels, and we asked them what they dissented from and why. To comment on their views, we have with us Professor Frank R. Scott of the Faculty of Law at McGill University, who is known as an upholder of the rights of people to hold unpopular opinions. Professor Scott, I'm afraid these young men cover a good deal of country, and it's by no means a well-organized tour. No, that's true, but uh, I wouldn't expect an organized group of opinions to come out of men of this kind, coming from different ranks in society and from England and from Canada, I think what they do give us is a positive outlook from their point of view upon the world they are entering upon. And, uh, of course, they do express some opinions which would be considered radical. But we mustn't forget that the young man's radicalism is often just an aspect of his idealism. Uh, he's beginning to look at society as a whole, and he finds it doesn't meet up to many things he's learned to believe are very important. And he wants to find an answer to it, so that his radicalism is expressing a very genuine desire for a better world, and it is part, therefore, of his idealism. And I think we'd be very unhappy if we didn't have radical young men always coming out of our schools and universities. Fine. Let's hear from the young men. We started at a place which has been turning out leaders of Britain for hundreds of years. Oxford University. We asked one of the officers of the Oxford Union Society, Andrew Rowe, why so many leaders came from that university. Well, the whole object of the public school education was to fit people to take positions of responsibility. In everything that we did, we were encouraged to come out in front. And again, of course, there's the traditional one of inculcating a team spirit. And this, is, I think, is very valuable. I always remember when I was at school, the captain of one of our house sides was playing, and we were playing a match, and the game had got to the stage where we were, had about three minutes left to go, and we were leading by about a couple of points, and the ball went into a stream. And we had every reason for wanting the game to come to an end early, but not the captain of the side. He ran all the way down to the stream, plunged in, completely dressed, came out soaked from head to foot, so that the game could go on with its chance of our being beaten in the end. But I think perhaps the most important thing about the public school is the Christian tradition of them. Deep down in, into the system is rooted the idea that those who have been given a great deal ought to be prepared to give out a great deal. And I think that this is a very important part of a public school education. I remember myself, when I went into the Navy uh, I, for two years, I wanted to get a commission. But one of the main reasons why I wanted to get a commission was not so much that I would have 18 months more on the lower deck if I didn't get one, 
but because my school and my family expected me to get one. And it is because we are expected, I think, to lead that the public schools have bred so many leaders. Tony David Smith and a friend live on a houseboat at Oxford. They are state scholars sent to Oxford by the government. And they're not in favor of the traditional public school system. Well, because I reject the idea that uh, a small section of the population, about 2%, should be segregated from the rest from childhood and educated separately, given separate ideas, separate sorts of education, uh, and enabling it to this group of people to form in afterlife a kind of self-perpetuating elite in control of the government of the country. An elite? What kind of elite? An elite. There is a tiny number of people in this country who control industry, business, the professions, the civil service, the law, the army, even the church. And these are the people that have the money to send their children to the best independent schools and from these schools they go half of the places in our best universities are filled by children from these schools and naturally when they come out of Oxford or Cambridge they get a better job and of course daddy knows the man in the foreign office daddy knows the man in the, the big firm daddy knows the man in the civil service so they get the better jobs they move straight into the positions of power Yes, but haven't the public schools turned out first-class leaders for Britain for generations? Yes, you're perfectly right. It does all those things. But what you just didn't mention was that with them, it gives the boy the idea that he was born to be the boss and that everybody else was just born to take orders from him. Everybody with a black skin was a wog and the working man was just a sort of species of creature born with a shovel in his hand. But, well, thank God, we, we've changed our ideas. Uh, Professor Scott, there's still a good deal of class resentment in Britain. Do you find this sort of resentment among Canadian university students? Is there a... do they attack the establishment, as it's called, in Britain? Oh, no, nothing like as much, I think, as they do in Britain. Uh, and I think for the reason that we haven't got that kind of establishment. It is true we have richer people and poorer people, but the social barrier isn't as great in Canada. On the other hand, I suspect that there are a lot of our new Canadians, the people we think have queer names and so forth, who find it quite difficult to get their talents truly uh, admitted and to go forward. And um, it is also true that we are not getting into our universities all the talent that lies around in our young people, because the statistics show that most of the university students come from about the upper 10% of the population. And we are therefore not really doing a thorough job. 22-year-old Lionel Tiger worked his way through McGill University, where he is now taking his M.A. in sociology. He was managing editor of the McGill Daily, and next year he will go to London University on an I.O.D.E. scholarship. Uh, the percentage of Canadian university students to the general population is extremely low compared to other uh, equally prosperous Western countries. And um, I feel that even some of the students who may have sufficient money just to get through, don't, because it represents a very considerable financial investment. Uh, as well, there's to consider the fact that these students could be earning a reasonable amount of money. Uh, these people could be earning a reasonable amount of money while they are uh, at university, if they stayed out and worked. And uh, two, since we're on the subject, I think that um, obviously, again, the vast majority of, of young Canadians uh, neither feel that they can go to university, uh, nor can they go. I suppose it's possible for students, if they worked very hard, uh, to make enough money each summer, and perhaps by skipping one year in between, they could make the money to go on through university. However, I think the kind of person who would do that, um, who could sustain himself, would not likely be a person who'd been exposed to a, a working class background all his life. I think that the attitude of the, if we may call, uh, working class person um, to university is not one which makes him feel comfortable uh, about university. He somehow may feel that it's removed from him. It's not really for him. And so this psychological barrier, which I think is very great and, and very real, uh, is one of the most important aspects of our uh, Canadian educational system. I know of cases 
of students in high school, the students who went with me to high school, who knew that they simply couldn't afford to go to university, uh, well, their work suffered in the 10th and 11th grade. They, they became uh, not delinquent, but, but certainly not as responsible uh, high school students as I felt I was. Um, but nonetheless, I don't think at that point they felt resentful. I know now, however, when I meet some of them, I, I'm quite conscious of the fact that they're aware that I've got it made relative to them, and they haven't, and they'll always be in the jobs they've got, and this is quite obvious. It bothers me very much because I know that they're capable. Aren't there enough scholarships to cover the good students who can't afford to go to university? I think our scholarship program represents um, a very courageous attempt on the part of educators to make do with an, a pitiful amount. Uh, and they know, as well as the students, that, that they're just uh, dropping a small pebble in a, in a bucket with them, and there, there just aren't enough scholarships. Are there many students in Canadian universities who, on the basis of ability and willingness to work hard, shouldn't be there at all? Yes. Yes. I would say there are students in universities, and I've met some, and we've discussed this, and they have agreed that they shouldn't be there. But they are there because um, they're too young to enter the business world. Uh, they, they enjoy college life. It is a good life if you want to enjoy it. Uh, most of them are, are wealthy enough so that they needn't have concerns about, about where their next meal or month's rent is coming from. And um, they're quite aware that the reason they are there is because their parents can afford this. Outside the universities, young men have other concerns. We'll let Christopher Logue, an angry London poet, introduce himself. At 17, I went into the army, first the commandos, and when they were disbanded, the Black Watch. 1948, and I came home from the Middle East and out of the army. I had decided that I was a writer, and I knew that the kind of writing I was fitted for, that is poetry, was not a product that the businessmen who decide how much things are worth care for. So I went first on the dole and second on the national assistance. I did this quite deliberately. Now and again, some timid clerk would try to explain that I should find a job. Various and relatives and friends tried the same thing. But it was difficult for me to make them see that I already had a job. I was a writer. Eventually they got tired of me, so I registered as a pauper, the only one in the parish of Poole. The first pauper registered in the parish of Poole for 300 years. Later I went to Paris staying there for five years, teaching English, helping to edit a number of literary magazines. Gradually my work became known by people, and instead of having to submit things, I was asked for work. Two years ago I came back to London. I doubt if I shall move again, unless they throw me out. Mr. Logue, what are you angry about? Or more specifically, what do you write about? Well, what am I angry about? Um, Chiefly, I suppose, I'm angry about the way in which people get cheated. And I try to write, exposing the way in which people get cheated, but without coming directly at the problem. Because if you come directly at the problem, if you cry, cheat, 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 you're rather like the kid that cried wolf, wolf, wolf. And after a time, your nose... Yes, but what, what is the cheat? The cheat is a simple thing, that people are given a whole mass of things to enjoy, and a whole mass of things that liberate them, but they get no time in which to enjoy them, and all their time is spent taking up getting the things that in fact liberate them. Take a, an English mine worker, very much like any other mine worker. Maybe his equipment's not quite as good as there is in the States, but it's not too bad in most mines. So he gets up at, say, 7 o'clock in the morning, he has a wash, he has some breakfast, and he goes to work. He gets to work at about 8. He works, shall we say, an 8-hour shift. Good. That's fine. He and the other miners have fought for ages to get an eight-hour shift. But, because he's got a lot of HP things he's got to pay off, he's got to work more than eight hours called overtime, or we may be sure that he's given the opportunity to, more, to work more hours than eight. So he probably works ten or eleven. Then, so he comes home, say, after nine hours. And he's tired. He's done a hard day's work. Now, what's he going to do? He's going to take the easiest and most simple form of relaxation. He's going to sit down in front of his telly, he's going to flip it on, and maybe if he sees somebody like me talking, you know, about things that are sort of serious, he's going to say, oh, I had enough of that, man, I'm going to want to go over and hear somebody tell a joke or something like this. And the joke will be just so as to jog his mind along a little more, it'll make a little mockery of his situation in a nice way, and this with hundreds of, uh, hundreds and hundreds of other things, like 
washing machines, motor cars, all the contraptions and gadgets that we've got, all bind us more and more, not to a freedom in which we can do what we like and exploit ourselves however we like, but more and more to the grind whereby we've got to earn more money, and so we're less free. And so we're cheated. We have no time. There are angry young men in Canada, too. At 21, Michael Pitfield has three university degrees, including one in law. He comes from a wealthy and respected Montreal family. I think that the Canadian angry young men are mad, or at least angry, about the self-satisfaction of the Canadian people. Do you think that the Canadian people are self-satisfied? I don't think there's a, a more self-satisfied group of people on earth. Is there justification for that self-satisfaction? After all, we are a country with seemingly unlimited resources and a high standard of living. Yes, they're justified in being self-satisfied in a material sense. But as far as being satisfied with the government they have, the arts they have, the colleges and schools they have, in other words, as far as being satisfied on an intellectual plane, uh, they, they have no reason to be satisfied. I think this has come about because being so close to the United States of America, the influences of a very wealthy neighbor, Canadians have developed a yearning for the material and physical advantages of the United States which unfortunately very often we're not able to provide and that this in turn has given rise to a, a class of people which are primarily concerned with commerce and mercantilism. Are you talking about the so-called organization man? Yes, I am talking about the, the organization man, the man who whose whole life is devoted to the pursuit of of commerce and mercantilism to the firm, the company, the group. Russell E. Moore, age 26, is creative director of the Schneider Carden Advertising Agency in Montreal. His salary runs to five figures. We talked to him in his company's model supermarket where they test displays of their clients' products. And we asked him what he thought were the main aims of Canadians. Well, I think I could sum that up with one word. I think success, of course. Um, I think they want to be successful in business. They want to have the amount of money that gives them a certain amount of leisure while they're earning it. I think they want to have the necessary means to indulge themselves, frankly. Indulge themselves? In what? I think in having the things of today, the things that count, the things that our culture is geared around, a car, a home, a wife, which is, I think, sometimes more of a possession than anything else. Uh, I think they want to be as good as the people next door. And I think it's a very healthy swing, a very healthy swing of the economy. If the Browns step up one from the Jones, the Jones are going to step one up from the Browns. Uh, I think that, more than anything else, keeps our economy going around here. Is this enough? Is man perhaps spending all his efforts for material satisfactions and losing his individuality and freedom in the process? No, I don't agree with the, with the premise. Man does not live by bread alone. He lives with and likes the bread and the jam that goes with it. Uh, just as our economy, our way of living, has released, let us take an example, the housewife from drudgery, I think that the tangible comforts that we've surrounded ourselves with gives us a certain amount of intellectual freedom, a great deal of intellectual freedom. I'm not sure. The friends I have and they're my friends because they're certain kinds of people, I suppose. Well, they're not particularly interested in material things. But then again, I know a limited uh, percentage of the population at, at the university, and I'm sure, and I know, actually, that there are many students for whom uh, the acquisition of material goods is extremely important, and that's how they measure their success, by the car, by the house, by the dress on the wife, and so on. Well, I, I hope I don't feel this. If, if, if at some point in my life I were to become very concerned with material things, I would be very disappointed in myself. And I think I will have to guard myself because in this society, with our, our terrific emphasis on consumption, uh, that one, one has to be consciously strong against materialism. Otherwise, one will succumb to the, the lures of the automatic can openers and automatic this and that. 
and I hope that I shall be able to uh, withstand the onslaught of advertising and gleaming chrome and whatnot. Professor Scott, is it common for the university students of today to criticize our materialistic values? Oh, no, I wouldn't say it was common. I think the present generation of university students is on the whole extremely conservative and uh, very conformist. And I know this opinion is shared by my colleagues in other universities. They, uh, they like the material prospects of this society and want to get out into it as fast as they can. In this, they contrast very much with the excellent uh, students we had after the war. The veterans, I think, were the best students I've ever taught in any time of my life. But today, on the whole, they accept what's around them and want to just take their part in it. There is always, of course, um, a lively and more rebel group in every university, uh, uh, and uh, they express a different point of view, and it's often quite an influential point of view. But I wouldn't say today that there was very much criticism of our material values. How does this compare with the students of the, say, the 30s when you began teaching? Ah, that was a very different story. But you see, I came to McGill in 1928, that was just before the Great Crash. And it, it wasn't very easy to believe in the material values of our North American society uh, during the depths of the Depression, because there weren't any values around, and the most powerful corporations were almost bankrupt, and it was obvious that we had been pursuing false values. And this had a tremendously educative effect upon well, both old and young, and it tended to produce students who looked much more deeply into things and who wanted to, to do something. And it produced reform movements, and as you know, it threw up the New Deal in the United States and it threw up new political parties in Canada and so forth. Uh, it's a very different picture today. It's almost today as though the very success of the measures that came out of that period plus what we learned, I think, during World War II as to how to control an economy. The very success of that has uh, given us a stability uh, which is reflected in the attitude of the students. Stability can easily lead to conformity. Uh, do you find that stability among all students? What about, for instance, the so-called beat generation? Well, uh, this is a phenomenon more American than Canadian, I think, though I believe it's spilling over into Canada. I would expect to. There was nothing like that, of course, in the 1930s, because the Beat Generation seems to reject just about everything. Uh, Colin Wilson is a 28-year-old writer, of course, you've heard of him, whose first book, The Outsider, uh, was a wide success on both sides of the Atlantic. We asked him what he felt about the Beat Generation. Uh, the Beat Generation seemed to wander from place to place never doing anything, just drinking an enormous amount and talking. For me, this is not rebellion, it's just complete and utter rejection of society. On the other hand, an enormous number of young Americans today seem to accept society totally and completely, and their single aim seems to be the good job, the big house, the large family, and all the rest. Neither of these seems to me to be in the least important. What is important, I feel, is the sense that most people nowadays have nothing inside them. They're like a, a tire when somebody stuck a knife in it. They seem deflated. And this is because of the civilization in which they live. This is because of the jobs they do. It's because of clocking in and clocking out. It's because of looking at television all the time and talking about football pools and discussing the latest movie star. The whole thing seems to me to be a, a series of causes for deflating people, for making them flat and empty. The outsider is essentially the rebel against this, the man who would again like to feel a sense of interior purpose. Are you an outsider? Uh, on the whole, I'd say no. I don't, think, uh, I don't think it's a particularly good thing to be an outsider. I consider the outsider a sign of a civilization in decay. I feel that uh, whenever civilization becomes rotten, the outsiders begin to appear on it like pimples. That these rebels would once upon a time have been, uh, I don't know, maybe 
saints, maybe men of genius, but now they have nothing to do except rebel. Uh, when, when we read about the psychopathic criminal, we learn that he's normally the insignificant little man. The man who bursts out into periodic violence is a man who normally lives his life on a general level of insignificance. I feel maybe this is the answer to modern wars, these outbreaks of periodic violence. The fact that everyone now is living on this level of insignificance. I feel the outsider is an attempt of society to move back towards health, towards a healthy attitude that will prevent all this. William Hopkins and Stuart Holroyd do consider themselves outsiders. They live and write in a small Cornish fishing village, and they're concerned with leadership. I think that only a madman would be satisfied with the health of society as it is today. Virtually every intelligent member of our society is too aware of the futility of his life the futility of the whole pattern of his own society. But after all, society has never been so well off in a material sense. And never have we had a society that's produced so many suicides. Never have we produced so many millionaires and never have we produced so many unhappy millionaires. Even to reach the top of material prosperity, to achieve the zenith of one's hopes and uh, ambition, is not enough. Man needs another purpose, another drive, another meaning. If there are any ideals that will help to create a new leadership, it will be that of trying to conceive of a developing man, a man who goes beyond the material values of today, a man concerned not only with the preservation of our species the, the, through the prevention of war, but the development of the individual to himself, the creation, in fact, of self-belief. Well, must, our leadership must be in this direction on the political level, but this isn't the only sort of leadership which is necessary. A new spiritual leadership is essential today. A new way of thinking must be propagated which gives back to people a sense of their own significance. And this is uh, what I would define as a religious feeling and attitude. Let's put it in this way. I don't think any uh, intelligent man would possibly subscribe to any of the present political parties in any country. The intelligent man is concerned only with his own development and the representation of his own understandings. This seems to presuppose that block thinking, which we find with the major political parties, is completely uh, contradictory to his own self, to the uh, contradictory to intelligence. We asked Christopher Loeb where tomorrow's leaders would come from. When we think in terms of leaders, the big men in the world, I don't say I'm admiring such men, but the big men in the world, the ones that make a punch, the ones that make a hit, they belong in the East. Mao Zedong, Khrushchev, Ho Chi Minh. These people, these are the big time leaders. Now, I think it's very significant that the West doesn't have a leader, as far as personality and stature, to put up against these people, because I don't think we need this kind of leaders anymore. You see, what advantage have we got out of these leaders? Now, there's no doubt the Chinese people have got some advantage out of having Mao Zedong. The newspapers will tell you otherwise, but maybe one day you'll be able to go to China and you'll see that they have. And so have the Russians. But do we need these big, strong, tough men anymore? I don't think so. I think we're capable of dispensing with leaders. The Canadians had different ideas about leadership. They talk more in terms of national and local leaders. My experience has been that the captains of industry, primarily in the most general sense, are the superior uh, prestige people in our society. Evidence of this is um, the composition of various honorific boards of campaigns and universities and whatnot, and where the people there, naturally, it is assumed, are to be successful businessmen. Somehow we feel in our society that we can't trust 
uh, important things to people who have not earned or somehow acquired a great deal of money. At some point in our development, I think this may have been very good and very useful. And in some areas, it may still be good and useful. But I think that we've outgrown the stage now. Mr. Moore also talked about business leaders. We asked him if there was plenty of opportunity for young Canadians in business. For a few young Canadians, I think, because I think only a few young Canadians are going to take advantage of it. I think there we're still very steeped in our place here. We don't have the, the urge or the drive to, to better ourselves like our, as our American cousins do. I think we stick to the culture that we were born to. Uh, we like to, to live in it. We don't uh, think about going abroad. I'm speaking mentally now as much as our American cousins. I refer to them because I feel I've been influenced a great deal by them. Young Canadians lack drive? Why? I think it's because they're looking for the safe and the sure. I think they feel that if given, as I mentioned before, this, if they do give this time and this loyalty to a firm, I think they feel that ultimately their future will be secure. I think they're probably willing to settle with mediocrity rather than settle to getting to the top. Probably they feel they have too much competition. And in truth, they don't, because there's very, as I said before, very few Canadians that are willing to reach out and take the opportunity, young Canadians, I think. No, they're providing very necessary leadership. But at the same time, so many of our leaders are concerned only with the organization man, with being organization men, that they have no time to be leaders and give their talents of leadership to the fields of the arts and government and in education itself. The day was when the university professor, the clergyman, uh, the politician, was a very much respected member of his community and was the necessary member of society. In modern society, this has all changed. And the man who is important is the commercialist, the mercantilist, the, the captain of industry, the titan of finance. Well, what's the answer? Well, what is the answer? The answer, as I see it, is that we're going to have to change our whole educational system. How are we going to do it? Well, certainly we're going to have to begin by offering to the professors, to the people who are going to lead the youth of the country into the, the fields of education and knowledge, we're going to have to offer to these people better salaries, better conditions and a prestige which they haven't got now. A prestige which will be able, which will put them on a plane in which they can compete with the captains of finance who have been decorated with the order of the Imperial Chrysler or Cadillac. Professor Scott, do you feel, as Michael Pitfield said, that people like yourself, professors, educators, have less prestige than they had, say, 30 years ago? Yes, I think that the teaching profession on the whole has suffered a loss of prestige in Canada. Though I'm hopeful that if the Russians keep on frightening us with the wonders of their educational system that perhaps we're going to go up again. I think one of the reasons is that um, the businessman, the great executive, is really the sort of supreme product of our North American society at this time. He has the great prestige and uh, he's a relatively new person in our society in the sense that it's only within the past 75 years or so that this has occurred. And I think his rise has resulted in a relative decline in the teacher and some of the professions. Do you think that this has resulted in uh, a number of young men deciding to be businessmen or engineers, say, instead of professors? Well, I think the young man uh, on the whole, tends to want to go into those activities that put him at the topmost parts of society. He's drawn, his ambition leads him that way. That's perfectly natural. And uh, therefore, I think m many of our best young people have been drawn off into the business world and education has suffered proportionately. But I've noticed a change in that recently. I've noticed more young students coming around and asking me about uh, the possibility mm -hmm. of becoming a professor and so forth. Do you think salary or prestige is more important in attracting a young man to a given occupation? Well, I think once he knows he's going to have an adequate salary to raise a modest family decently, 
It's more the love of the life, I think, and just the sheer liking for university work and research and so forth, more than prestige, that draws him, though prestige is a factor, too. Getting to another subject, one thing which w wasn't mentioned by the Britons at all, but was talked about by almost all the young Canadians, it was the matter of freedom of speech. Uh, Michael Pitfield, for instance, said that Canada had very few vocal angry young men. Uh, we asked him why. Because the well, one of the big reasons is that the facilities are not available to him. Uh, the television networks, the radio networks, are in most cases in the hands of government, and government is trying to satisfy a large majority of people, and a large majority of people aren't interested in listening to angry young men. The Publishers have a very small audience to feed to. They want a return on their money. They're not going to get it by publishing books by Canadian angry young men. The presses, as far as the periodicals and the newspapers are concerned in this country, are notoriously uninterested in expressing any view which is, which is new, which might be subject to dispute, debate, and discussion. The newspapers in this country, by and large, do not fill their, fulfill their calling of the fourth estate. Are you suggesting that no new ideas can ever be expressed in Canada? I don't think I'm going quite that far, although I, I seem to be going very near to it. It seems that most of the ideas which have been expressed in Canada have first of all been expressed outside of Canada and seep inside Canada. I think that's one of the shames of, of our press and of our communications facilities. Pretty good. What do you think, John? Looks, looks very nice. John Gray is a Toronto playwright whose most recent work is the Canada Council Commissioned satirical musical, Ride the Pink Horse. We asked him why he wrote satire. Well, satire is, uh, satire is destructive criticism. It's its own end. It, it sets out to prick the bubble, you know. Here we are, uh, I think, a relatively bombastic and sometimes arrogant and uh, plump, self-satisfied country, and many of these institutions, and often ourselves, need this kind of treatment, or else we're just going to get so far out of hand that we'll be unbearable, not only at home, but everywhere else. Is there a ready market for satire? Well, I should think all the media that are ordinarily open to a writer, for example, uh, there you can you can write books. Uh, of course, there isn't really much point in writing books because hardly anybody in Canada reads books. Or you could approach Canadians through television. Uh, that imposes its own peculiar kinds of discipline, the, the bureaucratic control of television, for example. It, when you combine a government agency or a commercial agency and a creative writer, the creative writer ordinarily comes off second best. We asked Mr. Moore if he believed writers were discouraged from presenting controversial material on television. Uh, it is being discouraged. I'll agree. Why? The, uh, tele you're, we're speaking of television. Television is basically a medium of entertainment. I don't hold with the fact that it's communications. I think that's a facet of television. It is a com means of communications. But basically, it's a means of entertainment. People are being given entertainment in return for listening to our message, to our advertiser's message. It's being made as potable and as palatable as possible. Uh, however, why alienate them by something that doesn't fit into their group? Why, why, why stir them up mentally when they are sitting down to relax? We said earlier that they have this extra leisure time to sit down and relax. They apparently don't, uh, don't relax with each other. They apparently don't relax with a book. They don't relax with a conversation. They've turned to television more than television has turned to them. Uh, again, why alienate them? Why not leave them in that receptive mood, that happy mood? Um, you can talk all you want on some forum uh, late at night on the CBC or some private station. You can say some pretty damaging things there. You can write inflammatory articles in little magazines. Um, 
you can you can hold speeches in church halls or or anywhere and say some pretty damaging things but the moment that you get on a mass media or write in a newspaper that you don't like the baptists or or you 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 like the baptists and not somebody else or you think that uh, uh so and so in the government is, is psychiatric or um you think that uh, the RCMP is is tyrannical or, or you think something which is not normally thought then you're going to get it and if not in direct political pressure or police pressure and i know of cases where people have been pressured by police action for believing as they did um you're 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 ostracized may not you may not be entirely ostracized but you're certainly not regarded as a productive and healthy member of the community and this is a kind of it's not for me to say immaturity but i suppose it is immaturity that we can't tolerate all sorts of uh, ideologies and all kinds of opinion in a, in a society i think that canadians yes they can say what they please but within very uh, circumspect limits and as a result of having these limits i don't think that canadians do say what they please most of the young canadians seem to be worried about free speech. Do you think they have any reason to be more concerned about this than, say, the young Britons? Yes, I think they do. It isn't that in Canada we have laws against freedom of speech, which are more severe than in England, at least not since the Padlock Act disappeared. But I think we just live in a stuffier society. It isn't so receptive to new ideas. And I don't think our young people are encouraged to express their personal views so much. There's something about our society that creates a very valid impression that a young man who wants to get on quickly had better not express too many strange ideas because I think his employers are going to look at him rather anxiously and wonder whether he might become a troublemaker or something. There's a kind of atmosphere of this sort which I think inhibits freedom of speech in Canada much more than any positive rules. Uh, a question we asked Christopher Logue, the poet, about freedom led us into a discussion on politics and on the threat of communism. I think man is going to make himself more and more free in the same way as he's got to the state of freedom and he's in today. Now, that sounds a bit abstruse. Uh, what do I mean? I mean that he's going to have to do it through political things. He's going to have to examine what politicians are offering and what underlies politicians. And he's going to have to ask himself questions like, now, exactly why do I have to go to work every day for so long? What has harnessed me to this, this wheel? And how can I best get off it? Now, when a lot of people start answering those questions, you'll find they'll find that these are not new questions and that certain answers have already been provided. Not the whole answer at all, but one of the people, some of the people that have been most concerned with answering this question have been called socialists. What makes a man a socialist is what he does when he is actually in power, when he has the reins in his hands. Now, socialists are obliged by the fact that they believe in certain things to do certain other things like nationalize the land, nationalize the great industries, take away from the hands of private people the things by which we live. The nationalization you speak of has been attempted in Russia. Do you think the Russians have freedom? Oh no, 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 no. The Russians have quite a different kind of freedom to us. Mark you, they have freedom. Don't ever think that we are the free world and they are the world in chains. We're both in chains, them and us. Only, you see, they have never had, ever, the sort of freedom that we've had over the last three or four hundred years. They passed straight from a stage of surfage, where if the Lord wanted to do this to you, he did that to you, straight into an industrialized state. And they were industrialized by a group calling themselves communists. I think they're very good communists. As a matter of fact, they then come anything like being communist, in my mind, what I've heard about communism. Uh, the the conflict between a communist and, and a capitalist system is, is I hope re resolvable but at this particular point I, I can't really see that, that we're approaching a solution in economic terms and this is most frightening because this is where we thought we were better at producing things and now it seems that we're not really and this is very disconcerting and um, we're being constantly told that we're not so good as we were uh, as we thought we were in education in, in sports, in music, 
and now in economics, well, that's the last blow, and maybe, maybe, maybe something will have to happen. Sure, we produce more hula hoops and more automatic things, and um, we have the highest standard of health, perhaps, for those who can afford it, and um, we have magnificent office buildings. Sure, we have all these things, and yet I think at the root of it, um, we may not have the, still the same confidence that we used to. I'm not sure. I hope, I hope I'm wrong. The North American business community is sometimes accused of being indifferent to communist economic and political threats, too complacent. Do you agree with this? No, I don't think they're indifferent to the trends. I think they're, I think they're fat. I call it fat, happy, and contented, morally, mentally, intellectually. Uh, I think if anything comes along to disturb that balance of power within themselves, I think they're going to react to it. Do you think we in the Western democracies are losing the war of ideas with communism? No, I don't think so. I think we're conscious of the need of that propaganda. And I think while we're not making an active motion, we're certainly making a passive one. I think our way of life, our mode of existence, the comforts that we have is just about the best propaganda that we could have. I think the world is very conscious of the way the North American lives. They laugh at it, perhaps. They feel we're overly interested in luxuries. Uh, perhaps we are. We shoot for a lot. We get at least half. And that half is at least two-thirds more than they have. Uh, we don't waste our time or our money or even our efforts in going out and convincing these people that our way of life is best. Probably if we did, we wouldn't have time to live our way of life. Again, I think to sum it up, uh, the example we set is about the best propaganda on the market today. Are you personally involved in politics? No, I'm not at all. Any particular reason? They don't particularly interest me. I think I, we should leave politics to the politicians. Well, in fact, I and a number of other people have, young people, have become involved in government and in politics. But the upsetting thing to the young person is that he goes in and he pretty soon finds out that he's got to polish the apple. He's got to bend over backwards to please the voter. That if he doesn't, he'll be tossed out of his job. That if he gets tossed out of his job, he won't be of any use to anyone. So he might just as well polish the apple. That sounds like a crack at the democratic system. It is a crack at the democratic system. It is, to me, the greatest shortcoming of the democratic system is that the voter is given everything which his whim and his will desires without it being borne in upon him how much this is going to cost him to have. This democracy of ours is in fact the, the, the rule of the majority and I don't think anyone would deny that the majority are quite incapable of understanding any real values. It's nothing more than the domination of the weakest, the least, the most badly developed, and uh, uh, the complete usurpation of the most talented, the most perceptive of men. This, I think, is a travesty of democracy. If we're going to uh, use this word, uh, democracy, if we're going to value the ideal, let's stop attitudinizing about it. Let's start developing people so they start thinking as a majority. <coughs> yes, indeed. Let's see the myth for what it is. Let's see that this idea of representative government is purely a myth. No man represents another. No one, he represents only another's interest. And this is the trouble with our po political organization today. It's based upon interest, self-interest, the interest of one group against another, one class against another, one nation against another. But we, we have to establish politics on a world basis now. The, the point upon which we and Colin Wilson do agree is that the political ideal for the future is that of world government. Yes, I think socialism uh, would be the word. Uh, this doesn't, of course, mean that everything that socialist governments do is correct, but I think the basic principle that the state has a positive function rather than a negative one, which is the, the crux of socialism, this principle, I think, we must uh, agree to and use because otherwise we, we will have an increasingly chaotic situation. We should bring to the Senate the leaders of our commerce and our industry, the leaders of our churches, the leaders of our schools, 
the people who know intricately the problems which they are handling. And there, these people can express their views, their expert views, and pass a second judgment on legislation which is going through, so that the effect of the people willing will have a second cooling off period and will be tested by men with practical know-how. I think anyone who wanted government by specialists would only call for misgovernment. What we want are broad men and uh, men with a rounded conception of their whole society. That's what we want. We want an end of specialists. Specialists are a symptom of uh, this uh, contemporary weakness we find everywhere. We must have government in future based upon some sort of ideal conception. We must be living towards the future, not just seeing how we can continue living in our state of lethargy in the present. I think that if the thing does go on, we shall eventually arrive at a civilization which is rather like George Orwell's 1984, a civilization of complete and utter flatness with people labeled units, just everyone on the same level of insignificance, everyone uh, failing to feel any sense of purpose whatever. I think if that ever happens, uh, there'll be a, a mass revolt, a mass explosion that could wreck everything we know as civilization. Man's at a crisis, and unless we can produce a new type of man, man is finished. I've decided that everything is dust, you see. From dust we came, and to dust we will return, and all is ultimately futile, quite futile, and, and you're silly to deny this. However, on this uh, profoundly pessimistic basis, you construct uh, a life which you think is happy and good. And knowing that all is dust, you can still proceed to do your work and, I suppose, raise kids and cultivate roses in a garden and go swimming and play tennis and go to movies and plays and read and so on, knowing that it's all dust, but this is the fun of it, you see, that, um, that you're with it, you're enjoying your life, even though it's, it's a minute fraction uh, and, and period of history and it's really unimportant. But if you can make it important to yourself, then I, then I think you've won, you've beat it. And I, I, I hope to, I intend to. This generation has often been called uncommitted, a generation without a cause. It certainly doesn't seem to apply to the young men we've heard, but is it true in general? Yes, I think that the students I meet are not committed to causes. I, in fact, I think they rather suspect causes. Um, there's only one cause that seems to concern most of them, that is, the cause of his own self-development. And I noticed that in this discussion. Uh, I think it was Hopkins who said that the main thing a person should do is to develop himself. Well, that's all very well, but after all, man is a social animal. He lives in a society, and uh, he has to be concerned himself with how it's operating. And I feel there's a lack of that concern in the present students. There was also a note of futility among several of these men. Do you think that has anything to do with the nuclear age? Have you noticed it? Yes, I've noticed it, and I was a little surprised that there wasn't more talk about the danger of nuclear war in this discussion. They did refer to the need for world government, but they didn't specifically speak as though they were in imminent danger of extermination. And I don't think this really... Uh, frightens young people very much, so I'm certain they're thinking about it. But there is um, a futility, I think, that arises through their feeling that there's nothing much they can do about things, that the whole situation is so complex that the individual really had better just try and uh, stay quietly looking after himself. I think that's what the sense of futility produces. This wasn't a feeling that the students, say, in the, in the 30s had, was it? Oh, no, we, we, we were pretty sure we knew what ought to be done that could do it. Hmm. Um, in the past, young radicals tended to be of the left. Uh, usually they were socialists. Uh, but several of these young men uh, appear to uh, be critical of democracy, to talk about an elite, uh, a new leadership. Uh, have you run into much of this? No, fortunately, because I quite frankly was a little bit frightened by mm. some of this talk, and I hope that this opinion isn't too representative. Uh, but this goes along with what I was saying before, the, uh, kind of disbelief in the ordinary political processes. 
and a sort of running away to one's personal little monastic life or something other to observe the world. Um, it's it's great pity that this is here because um, the political processes must go on all the time and we don't seem to have inculcated into our young people a sense that they have a social duty. I don't mean that everybody's got to go off and join a political party necessarily, but they must realize that this process is one of the most important things that goes on in society. Who was it said he wanted to leave politics to politicians? Well, that's just a defeatist attitude. In Britain, for instance, you, you find popular movements, well, movements for banning the H-bomb. We have no real equivalent here in Canada. No, that goes back to our uh, absence of imagination. I think it was Tiger was talking about that. We don't think of this type of action, and yet it has an effect. I'm sure a good deal of this um, lack of concern about political action, it's partly, I think, instilled into our young people, and this also frightens me, by the constant attacks upon government that go on all the time, so that they feel it's not a thing to be connected with. The government's almost got a bad name in our country at the present moment. Well, that you mean government on all levels? Well, the sort of feeling that, uh, on the whole, government, uh, the less you have of it, the better, whereas in the present day and age, uh, you certainly can have too much of it, but you've got to have the right amount. <laughs> We're not producing anarchists, are we? Oh, far from it. Mm. E except insofar as any man who does nothing but try and feather his own nest mm. is, in a sense, a kind of anarchist, because he's letting the rest of the world go hang. I don't think we're producing enough people who have a sense that they have to try to carry on the world's work, which is always something much more than their own personal mm. life and career. You know, the problem is, in one sense, how you take uh, Colin Wil uh, Wilson's outsider, uh, who has something to say to society, and um, provide a means by which that can be translated into positive action within society so as to give society a direction. And to give that direction, which many of these young men said was lacking at the present time. They know they described human beings as being flat and mm -hmm. deflated, nothing in them. There's no forward look to which they can direct their energies. Now, that's the thing I think, I feel, is lacking at the moment. But on the whole, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the generation you're teaching in university now? Well, one of the wonderful things about teaching is to see this continuous stream of extremely fresh and able and on the whole keen people coming mm -hmm. forward. We constantly produce them. I'm not worried about them so much. Uh, what I'm worried about is what the old generation may do to the young generation. I mean, it's the older generation that has the terrible problem of trying to solve this international uh, difficulty. And if it fails, it's the younger generation is going to be destroyed with the older one. No, I'm, I'm optimistic about the young generation. And if we fail altogether, it won't be their fault. This has been a comparison on the Age of Descent with Professor Frank R. Scott of McGill University and Ian McNeil. <laughs>